Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to a special episode of the Service Design Show. Today, we are diving deep into a brand new conference that promises to shake things up, advancing service design. We're joined by the one and only Lou Rosenfeld. I am going to go on record and say a true legend in our field. You most likely know Lou as the founder of Rosenfeld Media, the leading publisher in the design space. You probably already have some of their books by authors like Andy Pollain, Dan Moll, or Kate Towsey on your shelf. Why a new service design conference? What makes advancing service design different? We'll discover why Lou felt it was the right time for this event and why it took 11 years since Rosenfeld published its first book on service design to make the conference happen. Now, we won't dive into the specific program details today. That's coming up in a future episode, but don't tune out too soon because I've managed to secure a special discount code for you, the Service Design Show listeners. My name is Mark Fontaine and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Lou, I have a few quiz questions for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, Give us an estimate. How many conferences have you organized in your life so far? Oh, good question. Um, uh, probably 30. Okay, fair enough. Next question, uh, Lou, is do you remember the year in which you published the book Serve Design from implementation, from insight to implementation? Do you remember the year? I think it was 2014. Uh, I checked it. I checked it today. 2013, according to the website. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's about uh, 11 years ago, uh, and you've organized 30 conferences. Lou, how many of those were about service design? You know, that's a really interesting question because I think we, with all of our conferences, Mark, um, you know, like we've we've never really kind of focused on. We, we've sort of ste steered clear of the front end. We've kind of been generally panning back. Uh, I mean, our first big conference was Enterprise UX. I mean, that was, in a sense, uh, about systems more than anything. And uh, I, so I don't think we've had a conference before that was about service design, but I think anything that smacks of systems uh, has been fair game for our program. So uh, we've had, I'm sure we've had sessions that were about service design. And, um, you know, I think service designers probably would have gotten a lot out of our conferences compared to maybe some others in the industry. But um, yeah, this is the first time. So pretty excited by that. So uh, first time uh, advancing service design conference. What took you so long? Why, why, why did we wait, have to wait 11 years since the book Oh, till we, get, till oh. we got a dedicated service design conference. Well, first of all, um, y you know, like we don't do this lightly. We don't um, start or stop our conferences uh, very quickly. We're getting a little more nimble about that. But the truth of the matter is a conference has a long lifespan. So we have to retire something in order to start something new. We only have so many conferences we can do a year. We're at a point where we're doing you know, one a quarter, which is a lot. It's a lot. Um, but, you know, a, a, not too long ago, I kind of stepped back and I was thinking about, you know, conferences as an expression of where the field is going. Obviously, you want people to come to your conferences. What are they interested in? And um, uh, service design seemed to fit really well with the other three events that we do. So we, we have one called advancing research, which is literally about advancing, not just UX research, but uh, its sisters as well, other forms of research. We have design operations, which to some degree is a design management conference, but operations is really, really important, uh, uh, more and more important all the time, uh, especially as we start automating more. Um, and then we have a conference on AI and design, Obviously, uh, something on everyone's minds these days. 
And it seemed like a service design would be a great complement to those three, would really fit in nicely with our general thinking that where does the future lie? Uh, I think research is going to be more important than design. I think design operations are going to be really, really increasingly important. AI and other automation tools important. And the ability to step back and look at things at a services and systems level is also like critically important. You know, I'm an information architect by background. So um, underneath all those, I think there's a connection to IA and, and these, seem, these things seem to fit together nicely. Can you take us back to that moment? How did that reflection or conversation in your head go where you, when you, where you initially started feeling, hmm, we should throw service design into the mix? Was there a particular moment? Not really. No. Um, I think there's been like a slow build toward service design on this side of the Atlantic. I mean, obviously, the roots are European. And, um, you know, the authors of our um, uh, service design book are primarily European. I think well, Andy, I think, is originally Australian, if I remember, but uh, uh, sp spends most of his time in Europe. Um, and, I, you know, like, you listen, I mean, if we had done it 11 years ago, um, I'm not sure what the market would have been like here. It was still pretty new. But what makes you more confident that the market is there right now? Oh, what signals well, are you getting? You know, we did a civic design conference for a couple of years. We might have been a little early on that, but that, those were, in many respects, service design conferences. I mean, the public sector people, certainly over here, are really, really interested in, in framing things as services. Uh, it's interesting. We, we um, When we started that conference, we thought about the UX people moving into the public sector but we found UX was really not the frame they were using. It was either service design or customer experience, certainly the federal government here in the US. And when Biden was elected and was starting to invest pretty seriously in, in re-deploying uh, service to citizens, then um, you know it seemed like there was a real pull uh, toward the public sector. Uh, so that was maybe a little early and a little specialized, but we saw the writing on the wall that, yeah, you know, there is a migration away from the interface and toward systemic design, to put it really broadly. And um, that the, the Civic Design Conference was an indicator of that. You know, we look at things like book sales and we make educated guesses. We're not always right. Maybe we're early, maybe we're late with this one. I don't know. I mean, there's a healthy service design community, as you know. Uh, there are other service design conferences. Adaptive Path essentially had a service design conference here for a number of years. Um, and um, I don't think they called it service design, but they were certainly moving in that direction. And it seemed very promising. Then they got purchased and stopped doing conferences. Uh, then the conference industry changed. Uh, and now here we are. And it seems like it's, it would be good to have another forum for thinking about service design and one that has some North American roots. I'm very curious if you could walk us through sort of um, the, the concept or the idea behind advancing service design. Like what, what can we expect without going into too much detail with regards to the program? Because we'll do a special episode on that. Yeah, uh, it's a virtual conference. That's what we do now. We don't see there being a strong market for the kind of conferences we do that are highly curated. We invest heavily in them uh, for in-person. It's just too, too much of a risk, at least in the States right now. So it's virtual. We do a really, really sound job with the virtual experience. We could get into that, but we've been doing virtual, con we've, we've done like 25 conferences virtually since the start of the pandemic. So we, we do a pretty good job. Um, as far as the, the, the experience itself, it's a two-day conference. Uh, it has two themes, essentially um, looking at designing uh, services, uh, designing within systems versus designing with systems. We can kind of dig into that a little bit more if you like, but um, the uh, model is case study centric. So we have a highly curated program that is centered on case studies. 
Each day it has a theme. Each day has four case studies. And uh, each day has a featured speaker. And each day has a panel that looks back at proceedings of the day from an interdisciplinary perspective. So people who are not service designers, but have one foot in service design are going to look at the proceedings, look at the case studies, comment on them, uh, and, and bring in their own perspectives from their respective areas. So that's the basic gist. Um, I think it's important to note that it's highly curated. So we pay a curation team of uh, Ben Rees and Sylvia Bukire and, and Patrick Quadlebaum who've been working for months on this, and now they're working for months preparing the speakers and speaker cohorts. So I uh, actually attended one yesterday, and it's really great to see these speakers working together, not only to help each other and get help from their, their uh, curator, but also um, to create a program that has a, a strong narrative structure, that there's a thread between their talks, they reference each other, and the whole is greater than the parts. Uh, thank you. This was the uh, end of the episode. Now, <laughs> so uh, awesome. Okay, two days uh, designing uh, within the system and with the system. If I remembered correctly, you mentioned Ben and Petro Quadabam, who both have been on the uh, show as well. Um, before we get into that, I, I was also curious about. You mentioned already that service design professionals most likely would already have enjoyed some of the other conferences. Mm -hmm. Who do you have in mind for this conference? Also with what you just said that some of the people who are going to present and share on stage won't per se be quote unquote service designers. So who do you have in mind attending this conference? All of our conferences are geared toward uh, uh, people that are not brand new to the field. You know, we call it advancing service design because we think there's an opportunity to push things forward, to not do the basics. So we see this as being designed for people who at least have a couple of years of experience in service design or who have interest in service design. Maybe they are doing uh, systems thinking work, maybe they're doing policy, maybe they're doing something at an organizational level, or maybe uh, they're information architects or interaction designers or, or other people who tend to look uh, at their work uh, through a broader lens, that it's not just, I, I mean, well, you know, I've, I've sort of said a couple of times, it, it, in general, we try to kind of move away from the cosmetic aspects of design, the, the front ends and so forth. Uh, I think you see a lot of the same kinds of people interested in that sort of more systemic look at design. They, whether they're information architects, service designers, systems thinkers, whatever it might be. Um, I think anyone who wants to understand how organizations can um, collaborate to do bigger things, to connect systems as well as products, are probably the people who are gonna want to attend this conference. And, and we are like very specifically trying to push beyond the essentials or the fundamentals of service design. Now, I'm not a service designer, so, um, uh, you so, can you can poke holes yeah, in it, and I won't exist. be able to. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, it is you know partly. I think we'll be successful, Mark, not just because that's our goal, but because of how we curate and how we work with speakers. And well, tell us more. Tell us more about that. What's the secret yeah, sauce? I mean, so listen, I've spoken at you know probably a couple hundred conferences in my career, and I can tell you from experience that as a speaker, a good deal of the time, they just tell you as a, uh, whoever's organizing the conference, just, just yeah, yeah, whatever talk you've got sounds good. And yeah, just show up. And uh, now me, I'm not that confident as a speaker. So I, I have a horrible experience like the night before churning out slides and maybe I stay up all night. And the next morning I show up and I'm very tired and I'm running on adrenaline. And maybe, maybe, maybe I do a really good job. And occasionally I fail. <laughs> it's not a good experience. Um, and, you know, that sort of just, just give your talk uh, approach. I don't think 
serves anyone well. I don't think it serves a speaker well because they're not being pushed to do better, nor are they being pushed to learn from others who their talk is part of a broader program for. But it certainly doesn't serve the attendees well because it's just a, a kind of dog's breakfast of different things that may or may not cohere. So I think the process of spending time researching and designing a program and th taking themes seriously and trying them out, if possible, in a public setting, and then opening up a call for proposals broadly. So we had 130 proposals to speak for eight slots. At least Not for bad, case for studies. a first try, right? Yeah. And I mean, we could have done a six-day conference and the quality mm -hmm. wouldn't have been any less, but we've, we have a two-day conference. We've been very choosy. We had to turn down a lot of things that we loved, but weren't fitting together. And Send them so, over. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was great to see first time, like you said, but it's that consideration of how things fit, how ideas fit, and how people fit, and giving them three months to prepare together mm -hmm. is unusual. So, you know, I was just so happy yesterday, Mark. I, like I said, I was on a curation call that Patrick Quattlebaum was running with a, a group of our speakers. Uh, and it, it was lovely. They had all reviewed each other's work to date, had all commented on each other's work to date, and now we're discussing their feedback together and saying, well, you're covering this. I'm covering something similar, but I'm going to take a different angle now that I understand your approach because, uh, you know, we don't want to do it exactly the same way or we don't want to ambush each other and cover the same thing or have the di have opposing viewpoints not be ready for that, whatever it might be. Um, and there are, the speakers are actually thinking about the sequence. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you want to have the person doing the foundational stuff going first. Now we we work on that too, but ultimately to co-design this with the people presenting is magical. And we get people in many cases who are not experienced presenters through the CFP. It's a double blind mm -hmm. process. We don't want to hear from the same people again and again. You don't advance a profession that way. So by unearthing voices that may not be heard that often, very intentionally, we think we advance the field and we, we create a supportive environment through inclusion, collaboration, and iteration. That's our process. And so the call I sat in on yesterday, Mark, was the second of probably four rounds of, of work that these speakers will do together. And that's really magical. I need to go back to my early podcasting days where I uh, was already happy that somebody had signed, said yes to come on the show, but it didn't take me too long to realize that um, I wasn't doing them a favor by not prepping them. So nowadays I always do a lot of prep through email, through calls, and most people who get on the interviews enjoy that because it allows them to reflect, it allows them to push their thinking. Uh, yes, it takes them more time, but the end result is much better. Uh, and every, every time that I got on a podcast, um, I almost never experienced that. And you sort of get the, the same old, same old story. So yeah, I, awesome that you're applying that uh, and in, to a conference and it just like makes sense, right? But it's labor intensive. Well, look, look, trust me, a lot of people, you know, no matter how clear we make it up front in the whole process of applying to speak, and we do like many ways say this is a commitment there are people who start and you know suddenly they have the deer in the headlights oh my god what did i get myself into yeah yeah and they drop out mm -hmm. they drop out sometimes and that's fine because it is yeah. a commitment it is work but i think it's like publishing books there are very few opportunities or writing books there are very few opportunities we get uh to dig into our ideas with both the benefit of time and support it's a gift. You don't get that often. And so I, I believe very strongly in the value of doing this. Uh, it costs more money. That means our tickets are more expensive. We leave money on the table by not going for the quick, dirty, throw a program together, throw a book together. But I wouldn't feel very good about myself if that's how we did things. I'll, I'll fill that gap. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Um, so... Uh, you already mentioned uh, you, the part of the curation team. Um, out of 
all the people you could have selected, Lou, you picked Ben Reason and Patrick Quadabaum. Why, please? <laughs> oh, great question. So, uh, and this is a concern. Uh, it, it's it's pro uh, let me say it's problematic in a sense. Uh, and I knew this while I was doing it. So, I know them obviously because they're both Rosenfeld Media book authors. Um, and you know, I, I knew that they represented different sort of viewpoints on surface design. They represent different sides of the Atlantic, which I thought was also good. Uh, they're both, you know, as you know, super smart, good people. And I like that, uh, you know, nobody wants to work with someone they don't enjoy working with. That said, um, so, I, you know, I began the conversations with them. Um, but the problem with that is that they are people in my network. So, you know, a couple of white guys who, uh, in this case, happen to know about service design. So that is not something I necessarily feel great about. Uh, and, you know, just like we wanna have programs that reflect the diversity of, of people doing the work and who benefit from the work, we curation teams are pretty important in that regard too. Uh, you know, a, a curators bring networks and uh, they know people uh, and you want to have the benefit of a, both a broad and diverse network when you're doing things like advertising a new event or thinking about invited speakers and so forth. So um, I imagine that like our other curation teams, it won't be just, a, you know, a couple of white guys starting out. Uh, you know, a year or two from now, but that's where we are. And um, I, I, I had to make a choice. I had to pull a trigger. I was facing some time constraints. Uh, so not ideal, but it's something we're conscious of. And, uh, you know, as we've done with our other events, we'll certainly address it. For the few people who might not know who Ben and Patrick are, Ben is the co-founder of LiveWork and Patrick is the co-founder of Harmonic Design. Uh, like you said, both publishers uh, with you, um, orchestrating experiences and the sir, from insight to implementation. Yes, yes. Um, correct. Yes, correct. Um, from your experience with Ben and Patrick so far, what do you, you already mentioned, they represent different sides of the Atlantic. Like, what other inter interesting ingredients do they bring to the table? I mean, I think of Ben as, as you know, my understanding is he is essentially um, a, a founder of service design through the work at Live Work and uh, brings it like an incredibly creative mind, but is also a decent person that those kinds of folks aren't easy to like, you know, someone who's a founder in effect that doesn't bring a huge ego is, is rare. And I certainly appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, has obviously um, visibility and, and great connections in the industry that go back, you know, since he started doing this work years and years ago. And, and Patrick, um, you know, one of the things I've gotten to know since working with him closely, uh, I've seen some of the really interesting things he, he just sort of does on his own with public libraries. As a former librarian, I, I really appreciate that. He's, he's doing service design with public libraries just sort of as a, a volunteer, as a board member for some library organizations. Uh, so, you know, getting, you know, seeing that work, actual service design done at a local level um, has been a bonus on top of the fact that Patrick is, um, I mean, uh, you know, his he he bridges a lot of interesting schools of thought, like you know, not only the service design world, but the whole adaptive path network. Um, adaptive path is a really seminal, or was a seminal uh, UX agency uh, that um, ultimately got acquired and kind of you know taken apart by Capital One. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, a good number of our authors uh, have uh, worked there in the past and uh, they, their influence is still felt. Uh, so 
you know, Patrick had um, spent a lot of time on the West Coast, the US, now on the East Coast. I actually place a lot of value in geography. Um, I think these there are certain loci and between Ben and Patrick, uh, I feel like we've covered a bunch. And Sylvie, is, who works for, for Ben, another interesting person, I got to know her because she spoke at one of the civic design conferences. So she knows our process as, as experience it as a speaker and going through the presentation preparation process, which has been, which is really helpful. Uh, and, uh, came out of the East coast of the U S and is now in London. And it's just, a it's been great to get to know her. Well, she's been fantastic to work with. She's going to be, uh, on the show as well, talking about the Excellent. conference. Yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, I think this is an interesting, uh, curation team, uh, at least to have as a start. And there are so many more talented people out there, like you said, uh, but it, um, yeah, uh, not bad for, for a start. We so far have focused uh most of our conversation on uh let's say the the speaker experience or how it's curated which is super interesting to see how the sausage is made um what can you share about um the experience of the uh, attendees like what can we expect from uh rosenfeld media conference so i'd say the 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 way i would um recommend an attendee go into this is to see themselves not really attending a conference, but participating in a conversation. So in effect, the conference program is a snapshot of a broader conversation that's been unfolding over time. And that actually in our model starts with small conversations that start to gain momentum and participants. So a conversation, for example, that I was having with Ben and, and Patrick uh, last spring or summer has picked up a lot of steam. Now we have Sylvie and now we have other people who've helped us, uh, people who join the conversation to help us do things like review proposals. Uh, and it broadened further now that we have speakers who are now, who are preparing in speaker cohorts. That's what, those are almost like their own little conversations. And, uh, uh eventually we bring that conversation December 3rd and 4th as a program that we've designed to broaden to the attendees. So um, we have things that you would anticipate like a very active conversation in Slack. And we have a lot of protocols in, in place during the conference for, for trying to get people to really engage and uh, ask questions and, and be heard. We also do something that is unusual, but has been fantastic at all of our conferences. We give our attendees the opportunity, uh, no charge, to participate in an attendee cohort. So just like we have speaker cohorts, we have attendee cohorts. Uh, those are groups of around 10 people. It's first come, first serve. So uh, when you buy a ticket, you get the option to sign up for a cohort. Um, we find two volunteers to facilitate each cohort. Cohorts will meet before and check in during the conference on Zoom typically to establish shared learning goals and actually get to know each other a little mm. bit. So you'll get to know people attending the conference. Just like if you were at an in-person conference and you were waiting in line for a stale croissant and uh, you started a conversation up with the person with you, that's, that's like that, but more so. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so there's a bit of randomness on how we do the assignments. And um, then they have private Slack channels. So they are actually commenting together while watching the proceedings of the conference. And they have a little bit of private sort of help. The facilitators of each cohort are, are in a sense, ambassadors of the conference and are often quite helpful. Uh, and they bring ideas back to the general conversation as well. So it's conversation upon conversation upon conversation. Learning is social. And so we try to really build that in as much as possible. So this, if we look at the conference journey, there is a lead up uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Then there's the actual two days. Is there anything that happens after or is it like a closing ceremony and there is an off 
like official end and we move on to the next thing, which is which, like also a valid option. Well, so we, we certainly have a, uh, maybe not a ceremony, but we, we try to like have an ending. Um, and, uh, we keep our Slack space open for continuing discussions. Like, uh, for example, sometimes attendee cohorts might, people in a particular cohort might stay in touch and, uh, use the Slack channel for, for months. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we may provide, create a, a space for the Slack conversation to continue for everyone, maybe the general conference channel. Uh, we used to, and occasionally still do, offer free sessions, and we haven't pro like like we have probably about eighty sessions a year that we offer for free on different design related topics. They may be related to a conference, like someone who gave a talk that didn't make it, or pr pr proposed a talk that didn't make it, but we liked it so much we said, "Hey, would you like to?" Uh, to just do this for free, but we'll make it available for free. We'll produce it. We'll promote it. So um, we'll probably do that with some of the sessions that came through the CFP. But also afterward, we might find that there are topics or people that we want to hear from, and we might give them that platform uh, to do sessions afterward. We just haven't really had much opportunity to, to look at that in a curated way just yet. We've been so focused on the conference program itself. But yeah, we have, like I said, around 80 or so sessions a, a year. Sometimes they're related to conferences. Sometimes they're free presentations by our authors. They may be workshops for communities. They may be um, just sort of one-offs. I, I just talked yesterday to someone who wants to do a session on documentation. And another person who wants to do a session on uh, 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 all the, the key indicators, KPIs and uh, OKRs and many others. And uh, another guy came to me who's really interested in automotive UX. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I, I, I don't, I think, you know, why don't you just do a session? And it was great. So that's the kind of stuff we have. A, we put the recordings up on our Rosenverse membership platform and, uh, it's just one of the many things that that are available to people uh, on that platform, and and a free membership gets you to attend any of them, and go back to all the recordings, as well. So, um, yeah, nothing concrete yet. It's a long answer to your your, your innocent question, but I, I'm sure there will be things coming up that we will support through the Rosenverse. It would surprise me if you uh, get service design uh, service design professionals on board. Uh, it's almost impossible that they don't extend the journey beyond <laughs> the moment yeah. the, the curtains close. Um, so Lou, um, one of the questions that I had uh, also is, um, you like you said, you've already done 30 conferences. Uh, are there still things that you get excited about? And uh, if so, what is it in this particular case? In terms of conferences or in general? <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, if the if the answer to in general is none, then we can skip the conference question. Well, but you know, so all right. Um, first of all, you know the the world is big, so I'm really excited. For example, to to get to know more service designers and to to try to help the the goodness of service design rise to the surface even more. So uh, I, you know, I I just feel that pretty much everyone I get to encounter in a professional context has so much value to offer. And I get to learn through this process and, and get to see more people connect through the ways we convene them, cohorts, conferences, whatever it might be, and, and see more people out there benefit from our collective intelligence. So in the near term, like I said, I'm excited to see uh, what a service design conference is like and to get to know service designers through that context, not just this year, but in years to come. It, in general, um, I find excitement at intersections. So when you put together whatever it is, uh, you know, somebody talking about KPIs yeah, and KPIs, yeah. or you put yeah. together um, accessibility and AI or whatever it might be, 
that's the beauty of what we all get to do is it's it's not tightly defined, nor should it be. And every time we we come a, across uh, definitions that we feel comfortable with, we, we're, we're good about, I think, I think, being ready to let them fly away when they need to fly away. And, um, you know, so we, we're kind of always reinventing and, and folding in new ideas from new voices, new communities. And so I'm, you know, I, I love it. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intersector. Uh, my daughter, when she was uh, getting ready to start college, she was thinking she might either want to do marine biology or, or psychology. And I said, why don't you do marine psychology? <laughs> Let's put things together, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 interesting Venn diagrams. <laughs> yeah, uh, nice. Yeah, uh, it's a good movie title, The Intersector. Um, nice. Um, so we've um, we've made it to this point in our in the conversation. As now, I would say it's the time to sort of share where we can learn more. So we are excited. We are still listening to you. Uh, we believe in this idea of the need for a conference on advancing service design. Where do we go to and how do we get our tickets? Uh, so uh, rosenholmedia.com. Uh, you'll see uh, links to not only this conference, but uh, our other conferences, all of our books, the, the Rosenverse membership platform. So you can sign up for any of the free sessions, live, access them as recordings, get other discounts and, and, and other benefits. And, um, uh, you know, that website's certainly a work in progress. So, um, if it seems a little dusty here or a little broken down there, uh, don't hold it against us. We do a lot for a very small team, mm. but, uh, I would love to hear from people, uh, really Mark. I mean, like, it, you know, just what, what's next, um, you know, what, what comes after the conference, what, what's next in general, I've been doing this type of work for about 30 years. And um, the reason I started Rosenfeld Media was because it's fun to kind of pull people together to do things, but it's not always easy to, to create, take those initiatives that people who are starters are good at starting, but not good at maintaining and sustain them. So Rosenfeld Media is a business that's really about sustaining these kinds of somewhat community facing concepts, many of which I came up with, and I wanted to have a team that would take care of them while I went and waved my hands in the air and found something new. And if other people have ideas that they really want to find a home for with some sustenance, so a team behind it, that's kind of what we're here for. And uh, um, I work with lots of volunteers and in a lot of different contexts, especially in the Rosenverse. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if it's win-win, uh, we'll support it. And, um, so what's next, I guess we'll see, but we'd like to be part of it. And I'm certainly open to ideas, uh, Lou at rosenfeldmedia.com. We'll make sure to add the link to the registration page in the show notes. And, um, we have a special discount offer for all of the service design show listeners the details are in the show notes so make sure to go ahead check it out lou is there anything you feel we should have addressed that we haven't done so far uh, i didn't get a chance to to thank you uh, uh so let me thank you for the opportunity and uh you know this is one of the fun things for me is like you know i've known your work known about you for a long time but i don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to really sit down and have a conversation thanks to this work, about time. I, get, uh, yeah. I get to meet you so thank you mark i really appreciate it i uh, appreciate your work lou and i'm happy that we uh, finally found an excuse to uh, spend a bit more quality time together let's uh, <laughs> let's hope that this isn't the last time amen brother don't forget to check out the show notes for all the links and details on how you can get your hands on that discount code if you are interested in joining a special watch party with me, let me know by leaving a short comment. Also, stay tuned for the second part of our conversation about the conference, where we'll dive deep into the program and speaker details. You'll find the link to that episode also in our show notes. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a brand new conversation 
on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.